Uh, today I'm going to talk about a uh, method on reverse engineering flash memories. So, <coughs> uh, flash memories are actually used everywhere in our daily life. Actually, the embedded devices, they have uh, at least one flash memory there. And uh, these days, more of NAND flashes are more used uh, than the NOR flash. So we are going to talk about uh, NAND flash today. And the first process of doing reverse engineering is actually desoldering the chip from the PCB board. So the method we are talking about is when you don't uh, have access to JTAG port or uh, other serial lines, uh, the, maybe the last option is just taking out the uh, NAND flash itself and just take out the, uh, what is that, flash image out of it directly. So the first pr process is desoldering. So uh, there is a, uh, you, you should have a rework station. This one is, I just bought it from uh, Amazon. It's $150 uh, or something. So that is the most cheap one. And maybe you can buy uh, maybe $99 from other vendors that doesn't have. Uh, this one has multiple ones, so it supports this, uh, what is the air, uh, hot air blower and uh, soldering uh, kit. So it has both of them, but if you just buy hot air blower, it's like around $90. And you apply uh, heat around uh, the NAND flash chip and pins. And during the time, you should uh, put the uh, insulating tape. Actually, I burnt a lot of PC board without that. And sometimes, it's, uh, there are a lot of small parts. So if you apply the uh, heat around them, actually, they are blown away. So you will never find it. It will be under some carpet, maybe. So you should put the insulate, insulating tape around that. So it is really uh, important, actually. So the, about the temperature. Uh, the document said that 180 to 190 degrees is the temperature where the alloy, the, what is it, solder alloy usually melts. But uh, I found that if you just apply like 400 degrees, I think it's just fine for most, uh, most uh, uh, PCBs. They don't just burn, burn down at that temperature. So you are just applying just one or two minutes heat uh, to the NAND flash. I think 400 degrees, I think it's fine. So desoldering process is not that difficult. So it's really easy, easier than you think. And let's talk about the uh, big banging device, actually. So uh, though I looked up the internet a lot of times. I'm not really a hardware guy. I'm from the software reversing world, like last more than 10 years but I never tried hardware. So I looked up the internet and for, a lot of, uh, for information about retrieving firmware from NAND flash. And there are a lot of different methods tried by a lot of different people. And there are some myths and rumors. I tried this and it worked, but for other guys it didn't work. But using this method, FT, using FTDI, FT2232H uh, break, what is the chip? Uh, it worked fine for me, actually. So this one was actually suggested from who is that the Sprite Mode blog. And I was kind of skeptical at first time, but when I tried it, it really worked. So yeah, kind of happy at the time. So, but his method is kind of really hardcore, actually. He just uh, soldered all the chips to the board himself and put every um, part. But uh, if you are from the software, reverse engineering world, maybe you can just use my method. It's much, much easier. Uh, the breakup board is just sold around $20 or $30. You can just buy from eBay or other places. And this chip is really popular for hobbyist, uh, the, what is the, uh, uh, guys who are doing Arduino or drones, because you can program uh, other chips through this chip. So this board is really popular, so you can just buy um, probably find similar one from uh, other uh, vendors. And actually it supports a lot of different uh, communication protocols and one of that is MCU host bus emulation mode. 
This mode actually, it doesn't emulate the, the MCU itself, but it only emulates the MCU host bus, the pins from MCU. The MCU we are talking is H048 and H051. So this is the chip uh, MCU from Intel actually. So this one uh, was manufactured at first like 1980s. This one is a really, really old chip, but it is still manufactured. And I found that, oh, this chip is still used in somewhere like cars. ECU is actually, a lot of ECUs are using this chip. Because they are, this chip has been around like 30 years, more than 30 years. A lot of bugs are already fixed. So kind of really stable. So if some operations are really critical, uh, sometimes they still use it. So this uh, FTDI uh, chip actually uh, supports uh, multiple commands for MCU uh, bus emulation mode. Uh, we need the command for reading and writing through the bus, IO bus. Uh, here are like uh, how many, six commands. Uh, two of them, 90 and 91, are for reading operations. So you can through 8-bit or 6-bit address. Um, and next one, 92, 93, they are for writing through the bus, IO bus. Uh, it can also be through 8-bit or 60-bit address space. And the next one is 82, uh, 83. Actually, they are just setting 2-bit, uh, BD bus 6 and 7. BD bus is the, the name of the port from, uh, port from the FT, FTDI chip. So there is, there is a link from this document uh, presentation. There is a FTDI note. It has more uh, detailed explanation there. And the NAND flash itself, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, manufacturers out there, but they have a little bit different standards. Uh, but basically, these, uh, uh, these pins, uh, out of uh, 48 pins, uh, these pins are supported by most of them, actually. So uh, from the right side, uh, we can explain from the right side. Uh, there is IO lines, IO0 to 1 and to up to 7. There are 8 uh, IO lines. It means that uh, you can do 8-bit uh, IO through these pins. And there is a VCC, VSS uh, lines. They are like for power supply, 3.3 you know, volt. And the other uh, pins from... On uh, the left side, uh, th th there are some uh, pins for controlling uh, I.O. or uh, defining some data types. So th th there are some uh, pins like that. I will explain it later, actually. And here is the schematic for connecting between the FTDI chip to NAND flash itself. Uh, it's based on the schematic from sprite mode, actually but uh, we made some uh, change. Uh, for example, uh, the line between BD bus 6 to CE line, actually both of them were grounded from the initial, um, initial schematic from sprite mode, but we connect them uh, together because the CE line uh, is, uh, pin is used for actually disable the NAND flash for a while but it is not supposed to be used that much, but some operations need uh, to disable the NAND flash itself totally sometimes. So that's why we connected it, so we can control it from the software. And this is the um, actual device uh, I made, actually. So uh, you need wire, uh, of course, uh, wires and USB cable and FDDI uh, uh, breakout board, and the next thing is uh, TSO48 socket, and this socket is really useful because you don't need any soldering. You can just put the uh, NAND flash to the socket, and you can um, uh, connect the wires through uh, the pins uh, down there. Here, here is the pins. You can just connect it through there, so you don't need any soldering here. So I can explain, I will explain um, the meaning of each uh, connections here. AD bus 0 to 7, they are used for uh, data I.O., 8-bit data I.O. So these bits can be controlled by uh, four commands, 90, 91, 92, 93. They, they are for reading and writing byte. And for data control lines, 
they can be uh, controlled through 91, 93 command. They are for reading and writing 16-bit uh, address. Uh, that's how they are uh, setting some flag for each data. Uh, for example, the CLE uh, uh, pin from NAND flash, it is actually designating a byte as a command. So if you are sending some command to the NAND flash, you just set this uh, pin to uh, 1, and it means, oh, I'm sending the command. So if you set ALE to 1, it means that, oh, I'm sending address. So usually what happens is that you send the command something like, oh, I need to read a page, and after that you send the address. I, I want to read page 0000. And after that, actually, you can read the data from the NAND flash. So the, um, the last one is WP. This uh, pin is not usually set, but uh, this pin is actually for something like right protection thing. So if it, this is not set, it means that uh, whatever you are doing, you will never, uh, the chip will never write so anything to the uh, NAND flash itself. So you just set this to one whenever you are writing something to make sure that you are not writing anything accidentally. And there are other lines like uh, IO0 and IO1 here, the first two. They are connected to CE and RB. And um, IO0 and 1 actually was used as a interrupt handler pins uh, in MCU, the H051 MCU. So for example, IO0, we connected it to CE. So it means that if we write something to IE0, set the status to 1, it will uh, go through the NAND flash's CE line. And the state will be always zero, 0. It will stay at 0. And it means that the chip will be disabled at that time. So if you just make it to uh, 0 again, then the chip will be enabled again. And for IO1, so IO0 is for writing, uh, setting the state status of IO0, but IO1 is for reading. So through the IO1, because it is connected to RB line, it, it shows read or BG flag. So if you read IO1, you can see whether the chip is BG performing anything. So the other, the next two one is serial data in and out. Uh, those are called uh, strobe lines, actually. So this uh, this concept is very general in the hardware space, actually, right? So whenever you read or write data, uh, you are not just reading or write. Uh, just uh, just you you are not just doing it. Usually, you just signal um, the flash chip or other device, other chips. Um, uh, before it. So using these lines, uh, you can signal that, oh, I'm going to read some data, prepare them, some data for me, something like that. And for WE, I'm going to write a data right now, a byte, uh, so prepare to uh, receive the data. So these are called the strobe lines. And power lines, uh, there are four lines. We, co we connect 3.3 board and ground lines. We just connect them. And the good thing is the breakout board actually uh, support, it has port for uh, these power lines, so it's really uh, convenient. So for example, the read operation, uh, if you use logic analyzer and connect it to the, uh, each uh, lines, you can see, you can observe these logic uh, changes. For example, um, uh, the first, uh, channel one, uh, let's talk about channel two first. Channel two is a CLE. Uh, if it goes up, it means that I'm going to send the command. And just after that, the uh, RB line, the channel 1 goes down, it means that, oh, it's uh, doing something. It's, uh, it's kind of busy processing the command. And channel 3 uh, goes up just after here. Channel 3, the red lines. ALE goes up, it means that, oh, I sent read command. And after that, I'm, se I'm sending the address to read. And just after the channel 4 goes down and up, it means that uh, each the uh, FTDI chip is actually reading the data from uh, NAND flash. So we talked about the commands and the pins from FTDI, but uh, now we 
uh, let's talk about the flash memory's command itself. So actually, you, when you control the operation from uh, the NAND flash, you can actually, there are defined commands. For example, there are read 1 and 2. They are used for reading data from the NAND flash. And read ID, uh, if you send this command, the chip will return some ID, unique ID for the chip. In that way, you can identify the vendor and page size and all those uh, essential information. And page program, it is used for writing data to the page. And blo block erase, you can erase blocks. And read status, uh, some operations like page programs, sometimes it can fail. Then you can just retrieve the status to make sure that the previous operation didn't fail. So for read operation, uh, so the one thing is that uh, I'm talking about the small page and then the flash here because uh, it, it is more complicated reading uh, data, reading and writing data from small page uh, NAND flashes. So the large page NAND flashes, which has bigger page than uh, 512 bytes. Uh, the operations are almost same. The commands are different. You can just look up the data sheet for whatever NAND flash you have, and they have everything defined already. So, but the operation is kind of really same. So to read a page from small page NAND flash, which has 512 bytes of page size, uh, actually you can't read them, read the data once at one time. You read three times to retrieve every data from uh, the NAND flash. So the first uh, command is 008. It will read uh, the first half of the data page. And 018 will retrieve the second half of uh, the page. And finally, to retrieve the OOB area, the outer band area, you need to use 58. The reason why uh, the NAND flash has OOB data, OOB data, data is 16 bytes for a small page on NAND flash, is that because uh, the reason why they have uh, OOB data is because uh, sometimes, the NAND, because NAND flash is just a physical device, right? So it can fail or some uh, pages uh, have some bad, uh, what is that, some um, pages. In that case, uh, using this OOB area, you can just mark them as bad or something like that. I will explain it later. For read operation, this is very, uh, uh, what is that, the table that shows uh, the each pin state when the read operation is done. So when it is reading, uh, it will send the command 0, 0, 1, or 58, 1 of 3. And at the, at the, at the same time, it will set CLE um, uh, pin to one because uh, this uh, data is command. So CLE here value is just defining the data type here. So IO zero to seven, one byte is command. So next one, it is sending like uh, address. So at the, at the same time, ALE set to one, it means that oh, I'm sending uh, address right now. And the RB signal goes down briefly because the NAND flash must be really busy preparing the data. And actually, data will come out just after that. But if you look at the RE and WE, for writing this command and address, uh, the state, uh, what is that, the uh, uh, signal from WE changes. It goes down and up to indicate that I'm sending command or I'm sending uh, address. For reading data, the RE uh, line goes down and up. Uh, to indicate uh, I'm ready to read some data from uh, NAND flash. So if you take the uh, logic on analyzer dump from uh, this actual read operation, it looks like this. And when it is sending the command, the WE and CLE goes, uh, w uh, CLE goes up and WE actually goes down because it's sending the command, uh, it will uh, make changes to uh, what is the status of WE to indicate that I'm sending the command. And after that, when it is sending the ALE, same thing happens for address. And when it is reading, actually reading data, the RE, 
the read data actually is, looks like just one the phase change, but it is like uh, reading like, uh, for example, 256 bytes in this short time actually. So, uh, from the code point of view, so actually the sprite mode actually released the C++ version of code, and the other guy uh, actually. Uh, refactor the whole code and made it as an open source project. And I uh, just converted all those codes to Python and added the new features there because uh, Python has, Python is much, much easier to dealing with, right? So whatever experiment you are doing, you just change a few, few lines and you can experiment. But for C++, you need to understand the whole class structures. So yeah, this one, I just converted it. And the basic fun functionalities are same, and I added more functionalities there. And this one is open source, actually. So for this one, for reading, so you just need these commands to read data from a page. Uh, if you look at it, it's just sending the command, read zero, and read one, and read, uh, read OOB command. And after that, it's just reading the data. And talking about the reading data, um, uh, for example, the first uh, command is uh, flash tool.py.i, uh, i. It will just show the basic information about the flash chip. And dash r and file name, it will save, it will retrieve, retrieve whole data from the flash memory and save the file to flash DMP file. And if you look at the, um, how fast it is, it's uh, 9K uh, bytes per second. It's not that fast, actually. So you need to wait, like, maybe five minutes or 10 minutes. If uh, I actually dumped a USB stick, two gigabyte USB stick, uh, it takes almost half day. So uh, I uh, look up a uh, better way, actually, because the uh, dash R option only reads page by page. So basically, you are sending the command for each page. And I found that um, some memory chips, some flash chips, for example, Samsung flash chip, Nando flash, they support some additional mode. Something like, uh, it is called, uh, what is this, the sequential row read mode. Uh, you can read block by block. So one block is 32 pages in this case. So uh, you, you can save the time for sending additional com command for each pages. So you can just pass dash S uh, option here. So it will use uh, sequential uh, row read mode. But I'm not so sure other flash chips will support it, but basically you can look up the data shift from the, those chip vendors. So with this mode, uh, it shows 50K. It's almost five or six times uh, you know, improvement in performance. And about the write operation, everything is almost same except that it is sending command 80, and after that it is sending address, and after that uh, it, it can just send uh, the data directly, page data or OOB data. And the other dif difference is that uh, it will send uh, additional commands like 10h. 10h is the program command, so before you send the 10h command, even though you sent all data, nothing will be programmed to the page. It is just preparing the data, but if you send the 10H command, then it will commit whole changes to the page. And after that, it will send the 70H command. It will read the status from the last operation to see if the last write operation succeeded or not. So if IO0 is set to one, uh, set to zero, it means that the last operation succeeded. So for example, the co code for this operation is almost same um, as the other one, the read operation. The sec in command here is uh, 80H, and page prog is 10H, and it's programming. The, the, the one thing is that actually, before sec in, it's calling sec in command, it actually it's reading. So read zero, read one, read the OB here, but actually they are not reading, but they are, the read command is actually uh, has different meaning here because uh, um, the write operation can only uh, performed in 
uh, to the what is that half page? Not whole page can be programmed in small page on uh, end flashes. So each uh, read zero is just setting the pointer uh, to the start of the flash memory. So after that, it is just writing. And sec uh, read one will just set the pointer to the middle of the flash memory, and after that, it will be writing data. And read OOB will be setting the pointer to the OOB area, and it will be writing OOB data. So if you look at the logic analyzer uh, dump, it looks like this. Uh, it's a writing command, the writing address, uh, they are almost same. But in this case, there is no changes in RE signal. So the changes happens in uh, WE signal because it, it will be writing a lot of data to flash memory. And now we have all those, uh, all the uh, bare metal image we wanted. So from the hardware world, we are coming back to software world. Here, so for example, if you look at the page and OV data, uh, this one is 512 bytes of page data, and it has OV area here, so 16 bytes. Uh, the OV area has different format for different vendors, but Usually, they have the same component there, something like ECC, three bytes of ECC, and one byte bad block indicator. And the other bytes are used for other uses. And they are reserved for application use or something. So we will see how they are used here later. And for example, ECC, from here, there is a ECC three bytes. Uh, the first three bytes from uh, OOB area is ECC. But other vendors, sometimes they uh, place ECC here. Even Samsung, old document shows that ECC happens around here after uh, sixth byte. Uh, but the flash chip I worked on, it has the uh, flash, uh, ECC uh, at the start of OOB area. ECC, this concept is really interesting because the concept actually came from like 1950s. Uh, the uh, the first computers actually they used uh, what is that the punch card, so you program pro programming means you punch the card actually. So because the human is doing it, uh, there can be some errors. But if you make error, you should start from the beginning. It's a lot of effort. So if the error is error is just one bit or something two bit errors, maybe you can put some checksum that can correct it uh, automatically. Uh, that's what Richard Hemming thought about it, thought about, and he made up this uh, ECC uh, uh, Hemming code concept. And the ECC is basically using the same concept, and this uh, concept is also used in hard, hard disk technology. So in a lot of senses, actually hard disk and then the flash, they are very, very similar. And basically, uh, this table actually shows the concept of uh, ECC used in NAND flash memory. So this um, uh, diagram is based on the documentation from Samsung uh, uh, presentation I found somewhere. Uh, uh, there are, for example, this one has uh, small page uh, uh, blocks and 512 bytes here. And each bit is represented as one uh, blue uh, cells here. Bit 0 to B7 is just one byte, and there are 512 bytes. And basically, we are checksumming like every rows and every columns and with every different combinations. So it might sound really complicated, but it's really easy concept. For example, uh, in this case, we are calculating P8 uh, apostrophe value. Uh, basically, you are XORing every bit from uh, byte 0, byte 2, and byte 4, every even row, uh, even, even, even rows, and like up to 510. So just XOR every bit, and you get P8 apostrophe value. How about P16 apostrophe value? So it will be just calculating bits, XOR bits from 0, 1, yeah, something like that, 4, 5, and skipping two, two bytes, and it continues. That, that's how you calculate P16 apostrophe. And other values are same, same concept. You calculate every parity bit, 
And the code is really simple here, the Python code I wrote. Uh, I, I think that there, there can be some more optimized way to write the code, but this shows the concept very well. And everything is available from the open source project I disclosed. And for the, we calculated the col uh, row bits, row parity bits, and now we need to calculate the column parity bits. And it's, uh, it is the same concept, right? So for the P1, you calculate the B7 parity bits. And for example, P2, you are uh, using B7, 6, and skipping 2 bits and using B3 and 2. And in that way, you are doing the same thing for P4 and P1, P1, apostrophe, everything. So you have a lot of parity bits collected now. Uh, this is the Python code. This is a really simple code. And the last step is because you collected every parity bit for different combinations, and you just need to uh, save it uh, to uh, byte in byte form. And for this bit, you only need three bytes to save every all those uh, parity bits. And this is how um, the flash memory that I worked on actually saved the bit. <laughs> Uh, the thing is that every vendor, even the different uh, flash memory from same vendor, use different uh, locations for each bit. So if you use this algorithm here, probably it will not work for your own uh, flash memory because they are using different locations for the bit. So it's, it's kind of a guessing game. So you calculate uh, some value and you need to figure out which bit is going where. But it needs some time, it's, it's doable. So, so for example, so you might wonder how these uh, parity bits can, can detect and uh, fix the bit. So the one good thing about ECC is that if there are one, one bit error, actually you can fix it. So if there is one bit error there, and actually you can pinpoint, pinpoint that location and you can fix the bit because there is only two state in bit. Zero or one, if that uh, bit is wrong, it means that uh, it might be the other value, right? If that is zero and the bit is, uh, the par what the checksum is wrong, it means that it should be one. Uh, so, so for example, if you go back here, uh, let's think about just, uh, for example, the bit zero from byte zero is wrong. So it should be one, but it's, it's somehow zero, uh, uh, zero. It should be one, but it's zero. And the, this error will make P8 apostrophe wrong, and P16 apostrophe wrong, and P32 apostrophe wrong, and so on. And it will make, uh, this error will not affect other values, but it will affect P1 apostrophe, and P2 apostrophe, and P4 apostrophe. So you, you will find which uh, checksums are wrong, and you can pinpoint the exact location where the bit failed. So in that way, you can correct one bit error. So there is the ECC concept and the bad blocks. Bad blocks can happen. So ECC is for minor errors, but if the errors are uh, major, then you need a bad block concept. Uh, so for this case, uh, it is using uh, FF byte, uh, sixth byte of uh, OOB area as a, a bad block indicator. If it is FF, it means that the whole block is fine. So uh, oh, actually it is using the first page of the whole block. So if it is FF, it is fine. Well, for example, the tool that I release actually supports the battle block um, uh, checking here. So you run dump flash pi and dash b and the image file. Actually, it will dump every blocks that are marked as bad. And for example, the first uh, result here, 3A5CC00. If you go to that location, actually, if you check the OB area, actually, it is set to zero. It should be FF if the block is valid. It means that the block has some physical error, so it can't be used anymore. So you can skip those blocks when you process these raw NAND flash images. So you now have some meaningful data, just removing any bad blocks, uh, uh, fixing any ECC errors. Uh, now you have something more meaningful for software reverse engineer. And 
Uh, the thing is that I'm talking about the NAND flashes used in embedded devices. But I dumped some uh, NAND flash images from, for example, uh, USB thumb drive. Uh, they don't use this uh, layout. So they, because they don't need any U-boot or any JFFS there, they are just using their own format, like a proprietary format. Maybe they are using some fat table. Maybe they encrypt some data. Uh, each vendor will have different uh, formats or whatever, so you need to figure out them. But uh, mostly I'm talking about uh, an end flash layout that are mostly used in small embedded devices like routers or post devices and those devices. And the thing is that uh, ARM based, uh, the ARM CPUs, uh, they have some microcode actually checking every uh, storages that are, that are connected to the chip, the CPU. And if it finds a NAND flash, it will just load the first block from that NAND flash. So the first block will contain the first stage uh, uh, boot code there. So it will have a lot of like uh, uh, ARM instructions there. And after that, we will call uh, next level bootloader that has more complicated logic. And that is usually U-boot. And maybe there, there, there are uh, other options too. And after that, it will have some U-boot images, multiple images. And finally, it will have a real file system like JFFS2, some incremental uh, journaling file system there. And let's talk about each one of them. So the first stage um, um, bootloader looks like this. And they are just starting from the block zero, the first block, block one, actually. So you can just take out the first block and just save it to file. And you can just load it from IDA and set the CPU to whatever CPU you use. So for example, this in, in this case, I set it to ARM, just ARM. And it will just decompile, uh, de disassemble uh, like this. And it is actually uh, ARM code there. And if you look up some addresses there, and you can search for that, and actually they represent some pins or some registers in ARM CPU. They are really low level operations. And some strings, some interesting strings, or something like that, uh, shows that NAND bootloader Adam 3.24. I don't know uh, if this one is open source or some commercial one. But uh, the message is something like a loading u -boot. So you, you can see that this one will load u -boot after this. So you take out the u -boot code. The, probably the, from the next block, the u -boot code will start. And you can, take, you can just take dump from that part. And you can just load it from uh, IDA. And it will have some UBU code there, but they are not really meaningful because they are UBU is just uh, what is the open source code, and probably they will just use it. So there are much things, a lot of things to look into here. But the interesting part starts here: the uh, UBU code, and after that there must be one or two UBU images. Actually, they are just uh, packed with UBU uh, format, UBU image format. Here's the header file from the Uber project. And the first four bytes are magic value. So uh, identifying the Uber images are really, really easy because you just go to the start of each block. And if the first four bytes are this magic value, there are a lot of chances that those blocks are used by Uber images. So in that way, you can easily identify Uber images. And there is a tool called the bin walk, actually. So I guess that one is also using some pattern matching. So probably you don't even need to use it because you, know, you can go there, check four bytes, and there is a header structure here. So e even there is image length. So you can use this image length to find the end of this uh, UBOOT image. And here's the way how you can calculate the whole image, end of the image, because uh, the raw image contains the OOB area, so you need to calculate uh, that part. But basically, it's just math. And you, after you calculate the end of the uh, UBoot image, actually, you can use dump flash tool that I'm going to release. And you can just set the range from this address to this address and dump out to this file and from this flash dump file. And it will save. And it will remove OOB area and battle blocks. And it will save as a one file to the file system. And 
Uh, the good thing is that IDA supports UBoot images, so you can just load up the UBoot image, but it has some restrictions. For example, the one of the format from UBoot is multiple image, and actually IDA is not recognizing it, it co correctly. But the other way is just uh, opening up the image from hex editor. If this byte, the type byte is four, it means that this one is multiple image. Uh, then uh, just uh, 40 bytes is the UBoot image header. Just e after this UBoot image header, uh, there comes the uh, image length for each, uh, uh, what is that, each file. There are multiple files. In this case, there are two files, and after that, there are zero. There is a zero, it means that uh, it's the end of the image length. And using this information, you can actually take out each images. And uh, from the Linux, you can use the MK image, and you can see there are two images there. But there is, uh, I don't think there is any tool to actually extract each uh, image separately. But you can just use a hex editor. Or maybe you can write some Python, ba very basic Python script if you want. And uh, one of these uh, images I dumped actually was a RAM disk. And uh, that one is compressed, and I just decompressed that image, and I found that uh, that one using file command. And even though you just open it up from the hex editor, you can see a lot of file names there. Uh, you can guess that, oh, maybe this one is a file system, right? So this one, in this case, uh, the machine that I worked on, the chip my, I worked on has ext ext2 file system there. So I used the MTD device to load uh, the image. You can just use DD, and uh, this is straightforward process. Uh, you can just mount it to your system, and you can actually look into the file system. You can uh, modify the files, and you can write it back to the flash memory if you want. And the other images, sometimes, uh, many times, they save kernel images to UBoot images. And even the MK image command can tell whether uh, the what is that UBoot image is ARM Linux kernel image or not. So in this case, it shows that it, this one is uncompressed. But actually, it has some compressed image here. So uh, there are some debugging messages here. Uh, but basically, from the kernel image, you can just search for this GZIP image magic value, like uh, 1F8B. Uh, Probably you will just find one instance of it, and after that is actually actually GZIP uh, kernel image, and you just take out that part. And even the debugging messages here are kind of useful because it's just saying uh, uncompressing Linux or other messages. So you can guess easily guess that this part are this part is actually a compressed kernel image. You just take it out and you can load it from IDA. Uh, but all those things here are actually use uh, kernel images, U-boot, and some basic M uh, what is that, RAM disk image. But the actual data is saved in JFFS2 file system in many cases. So that I, I heard that I know that there are multiple uh, journaling file system, but one of those system is uh, very popular, like JFFS2 here, and. Advantage with uh, working with NAND flash memory raw image is that uh, actually the JFFS2 file system uh, leaves, when you are formatting the NAND flash, it will leave some markers uh, in the OOB area. And for example, here, the last line from the hex dump is three bytes are ECC, and sixth byte is a bad block indicator. And from the six to seven, Ninth from the ninth byte, they are used by uh, JFFS2. So they will use always same marker here. So I don't know how they chose those values, but they will use always same values if the block is used by JFFS2. So you can easily identify JFFS2 file systems using this method. So you can use MTD device and do the same thing as you did for uh, RAM disk. So you just uh, dump, you just take out the JFFS file system and just write it to the MTD block and just mount it from uh, that uh, MTD block 
and you have full access to the file system in this case. So this is one thing that I improved with the open source project. Actually, the original NAND tool project didn't support uh, writing. Actually, some code was there, but actually, uh, it was obvious that the code was never used because there is no code actually that is calling that part. So um, the Flash tool Python uh, code will uh, write uh, data to the pages actually. So the process is simple. So you make some changes to the file system from MTD block, and you can just dump out whole uh, image using DD. So here, the IF from the MTD block, and just save it to file. And you can directly write whole files the, uh, to the NAND flash. But actually, the image from MTD doesn't have OOB data. Uh, you need to put uh, OOB data uh, using this tool, dump flash uh, pi. And dash R will reconstruct every OOB data Supposing this um, image is JFFS2, it will put every JFFS2 erase marker, and it will create a new image like a MTD block zero OB uh, dot dump. This is a new dump file that has uh, OB uh, OB lines data, and you can program it using a flash tool, and you can pass W option here, and Pass the file and dash r and the location of uh, the write operation and and this is the start and because you don't know the end you don't care about the end you just pass zero x f f and you will uh, write the file up to where the file ends and that is what the software thing happens and the thing is that the next tricky issue is that actually. Uh, you need to put back the NAND flash to the board, the PCB board. So this is the most difficult part, actually, for software, engine, software reverse engineers, because uh, this is the SMT uh, chips. So SMT is uh, surface mount technology chips. Uh, they are supposed to be handled through some automation, like uh, machines. It is supposed to be put into the board through the machines. Uh, that's how they made in the first place. So just soldering uh, SMT chips to the PC board, it takes some effort. You need some trainings, some learning curves. Uh, and I found that a there are a lot of um, uh, YouTube videos about how you can put the SMT chips on the board using solder or some basic uh, equipment you have. And there are many different uh, methods suggested. And you can, you might try with some uh, chips that you don't really use, and you can try that. And if you are really good at it, maybe you can try that on some important uh, devices. But uh, it takes some effort. Um, uh, the other issue is something like it, it is really uh, common that you see some bridges, and here this is actually from what I did for my uh, project. So damaged uh, pins, actually the pins, like four, four or five pins are just gone because I applied too much heat and I applied it repeatedly and I applied flux again. Actually flux is really bad for these uh, pins because they actually melt these chips away from the board. Uh, these things really happen, happen really commonly. Uh, but the good, good thing is that um, the these damaged pins usually happens when the pin is not connected to the main circuitry. So uh, we talked that some pins from flash memory, they are not actually doing anything. So they are just reserved pins. Uh, and on PCB board, actually the pins on the PCB board, uh, they are not connected to anything. They are just glued to the PCB. And they are more vulnerable to this damage. So in that case, even though they are damaged, maybe you can try to uh, connect uh, other pins. Maybe it will work. You can just refer the data sheet from the vendor, the NAND chip vendor, and you can be sure uh, whether that chip is used or not. 
And I, th these projects are already released in the Flash 2 project. It's on GitHub. And it supports write operation. And it supports a fast sequential row read mode, which is five or six times than, faster than uh, the old method. And because this code is written in flat, uh, the Python code, it is like almost 600 lines or something. So you can do some experiment with this Python code. Uh, there is other project, Enhanced NAND tool. So this one is from the original NAND tool uh, project. I just added the writing support. The one problem is that uh, this NAND tool project is using old uh, schema schematic from uh, sprite mode. And for this new Flash tool, it is using new schematic from me, uh, which is presented here, because the, what is that, fast sequential row read mode needs uh, some control over CE uh, pins. So the other projects, like a dumb flash Python code, this one actually manipulates the image file in the low level. It can handle ECCs, battle blocks, but I put some, a few logics for ECCs, but probably you, your vendors might be using a little bit different ECC uh, algorithms. In that case, maybe you can add it based upon the code already there. Probably it will not be that different. A little bit different, only the location changes. And the last tool is dump JFFS2 Python code. This one actually parses uh, each JFFS record from the raw image, and it can tell the history of uh, the, what is the file operations that happened in uh, the JFFS file system. And the conclusion is that uh, even though using JTAG is recommended doing some embedded uh, system research, but there are some uh, occasions that uh, JTAG is not feasible. Maybe you don't have any time to figure out how uh, JTAG is there. Maybe the JTAG is uh, obfuscated a lot, or it is removed. It's just burnt out. And th there can be a lot of different, uh, different situations. Uh, and the other case is the f uh, USB, for example, USB thumb drives. Uh, they don't have any JTAG, obviously, because they don't have any real CPU there. They only save some data there in the what is the flash memory. In that case, you just take out the flash memory from USB thumb drive, and you do, you you, do, you just dump out the uh, the data and look into it. Uh, it's really interesting, actually, what they are saving in raw level format. It's really interesting. In that case, you can use this method, and there are actually commercial so commercial solutions for same function like uh, I don't know exact the vendor name. They are selling like thousand dollar a flashy reader or something, but this one is just $60, up, up to $60, and you can make one device. And every code is open source, and it's free. And uh, you can basically, uh, disordering method is called uh, destructive, me destructive method, but it's not really destructive. You can just put back uh, the chip again back to the PCB board. It's possible. But the one problem is that uh, if you, the, what is that, hot air blowing mo method, it's much, much safer. If you use chip quick or other, uh, like, uh, method, actually they make, uh, what is that, resoldering very, very difficult because it leaves a lot of, like, chemicals or whatever. It's not that easy to put back the uh, NAND flash again if you use that. But hot air blowing, it's kind of okay. And there are many factors like ECC. You need to consider ECC, battle blocks, and JFFS2. Probably other uh, embedded device might be using other uh, journaling file system. You need to consider that. And, and you need to consider U-boot images. And there are a lot of things to consider if you use uh, this method. But it's uh, worth to uh, uh, invest your time on, and resource uh, when you don't have any other options. And that's it. And there are credits for the original design for NAND reader and writer. It was sprite mode. I tried a lot of different ways, but this one is the only way that I succeeded. And NAND tool, it's the code from sprite mode and other, uh, the guy who I can't pronounce the name, he actually refactored the code and I wrote I, uh, my own project based upon this code. 
and that's it. And any questions or I think we have five minutes. <laughs>